everybody, Dr. Rob Silverman here. I'm excited. I've got health enthusiast, health aficionado, the man who's taught so many trainers, doctors, and clients alike about health. I've got Mr. Sam Miller here today. Thanks, Dr. Rob. It's good to be with you. Sam, I'm, again, I'm, I'm really excited. You know, you have more of a decade of experience in health and fitness as a nutrition coach. You have programs that help coaches and health professionals improve their clients' results. You've got this online thing going on. You're an online educator. You know, where can people find that? So most of my resources on social media or the podcast are just Sam Miller Science. So all of my main handles and the podcast, it's where we put out a lot of no-cost content. And then, um, you know, one of our primary programs is Metabolism School, which is basically an online platform for folks who are looking for live education and support related to nutrition, more on physiology, the endocrine system, gut health, and a lot of the things that we're starting starting to see as the new normal, right? So when, when Dr. Silverman and I have connected in the past, I think what we've sort of shared and bonded over is just the sort of common client or patient experience of what is sort of uh, happening in, in the 21st century. And so uh, we're really just dedicated to creating some resources to better help, you know, professionals serve you know, that population compared to maybe some of the conventional mainstream stuff that's not not really getting them the results that they're looking for. You know, um, I want everybody to know that Sam's really open to a lot of questions. And I, I know it's Tuesday in August in the summer. So when you want to have a question answered, feel free to type it in. I'll share it with him. We've got a litany of things to go over. Um, some of the topics that I really want to cover, you know, you spoke about your metabolism school. And you said it's sort of a catch-all phrase. It's sort of an intersection between nutrition, um, gut health, uh, immune health, et cetera. So I really want to you know, give you the baton and let you roll with that. Yes, for sure. So kind of as I was coming up in the industry, one, one expression that I really liked from a colleague that I'm still close with is sort of the the way that we can look at metabolism as this sort of stress barometer, but also the way I've kind of evolved that explanation or brought it into my own practice is really looking at, okay, what are some of the variables we're accounting for? And we certainly have, um, you know, various environmental stressors, internal stressors, you know, things like, you know, inflammation or, you know, Dr. Silverman talks a lot about gut health. If that is uh, awry, that's certainly going to be a stressor in terms of our, our client or patient results. And we also have energy, right? So someone on the standard American diet is largely consuming far too many um, calories or very you know high energy diets uh, that essentially we're, we're unable to pull all that energy through the system. And that's where we see people develop things like insulin resistance, metabolic syndrome, type 2 diabetes, or we have folks who are always on a diet. And they are in more of a hypocaloric state, not necessarily fueling their body with the nutrients they need. So if we look at this intersection in client populations, we see sort of different cases manifest depending on those two variables of stress and energy. We have the person who's maybe the chronic dieter, who's very high stressed, burning the candle at both ends, not getting enough parasympathetic activity that may manifest as you know, thyroid downregulation or autoimmunity, gut health issues. That's sort of one client avatar or patient avatar. And then you tend to see the folks where, you know, they're, they're overfed, but undernourished micronutrient status is very poor. Um, you know, maybe living a sedentary lifestyle, not moving enough, um, not getting outside that can lead to different things. If they're potentially, you know, overweight or insulin resistant, we may see some sleep apnea as well. So there's a lot of different things that can sort of come from those two sort of starting points. And so I look at those foundational variables really just as a way, uh, it's really just a jumping off point or way that we can view client transformation at a very high level. And then we can start to parse out things that are going on for that individual based on symptoms, you know, quality of life, uh, potentially lab results or things we're seeing in testing. And then obviously we maybe have our preferred intake forms or questionnaires that we use to get a you know, greater level of uh, depth in terms of that client or patient experience. So when I think about metabolism, it's really just, okay, we have this intersection point of you know, stress, which is represented in terms of our physiology and a lot of the manifestations in terms of the symptoms we're experiencing. And then energy, which is really what are we doing from a dietary perspective or nutrition perspective, uh, both at, you know, kind of the macro level in terms of our intake, but also in terms of the quality of our food uh, from a micronutrient perspective as well. Let's get involved. There's a, there's a lot to go through there. As I always use the expression, there's a lot to unpack. That said, let's talk about this chronic dieter. 
you know, the person, the, pa the patient and the clients that you and I both see all the time. The person who says, you know what? I hit plateaus all the time. I've tried every diet under the sun and nothing's worked. And of course, they're ba still basing on what you called it the standard American diet, sad. 70% of the standard American diet is ultra processed food, too much gluten, too much dairy, too much sugar, too much fructose. In light of the energy, why don't we talk about that chronic diet and where they're going wrong and some of the quick uh, steps, quick hacks that you may recommend for them to you know, reach some new outcomes? For sure. So I think we've got a couple of things from a lifestyle perspective. Um, you know, I think one is just in terms of overall sleep uh, is a huge issue, you know, in terms of uh, that the chronic dieter, we're also seeing them tend to, you know, they, they over exercise and maybe in terms of scheduled sessions throughout the week, or they go to different classes, but the chronic dieter oftentimes is neglecting non-exercise movement and parasympathetic activities like walking, which can actually be great for digestion, insulin sensitivity, also getting sunlight, very helpful from a circadian perspective in our diurnal rhythm. Now on the dietary front, I think what we see with chronic dieters is oftentimes when they are under consuming, uh, maybe not getting enough protein and things that are helping to uh, you know, assist from a satiety perspective and also help with overall uh, adherence to the actual program. So what you see these people do is they kind of, they're on the wagon, they're off the wagon, on the wagon, off the wagon. It's because they have a hard time managing uh, appetite. They have a hard time with their cravings. Now, part of that is the food choices as well that may be triggering them to overeat in certain instances. But I think within the dieter population, we see a couple different folks. One is um, they are uh, very restrictive. They're, they're overachieving on the exercise front. And then we maybe have the chronic dieter where it's like they always have weight to lose, but because they haven't necessarily found the appropriate approach for them, uh, it leads to this on again, off again, sort of yo-yo. And in those situations, what we tend to see is maybe enough restriction or deprivation to start a bit of what we see in terms of metabolic adaptation, uh, HP axis activation, thyroid down regulation, maybe from a subclinical level, but then they don't actually, you know, stick with it long enough to really get any sort of weight loss benefits. And then due to the poor diet quality, they essentially uh, sort of rebound into overeating or they're unable to manage those hunger and satiety cues. And then they end up in a worse spot than they were before. So they essentially always, you know, maybe losing five pounds to gain 10 pounds and then losing five pounds to gain 10 pounds. And it's a really vicious cycle and it leads to, you know, pretty uh, deleterious metabolic consequences from the perspective of, you know, that's not an optimal state from a hormonal perspective. Also from a uh, a mindset perspective, these folks are obviously struggling as well because they want to be successful, but it's, they start to get very discouraged and then it makes it harder and harder for them to, to see things through. So in that population, I think when we speak of the chronic dieter, we have to first identify, okay, is this person actually achieving an energy deficit in that, you know, they're, they're consuming a, um, a lower amount of calories to where they could lose weight. And some of those folks may focus on food quality as well and micronutrient dense foods, minimally processed foods. But then there are folks who may be on the other end that, you know, think they're following some sort of mainstream diet of some kind, but they're really unaware of some of the most important variables and transformation. So as far as the low hanging fruit, I think first looking at things like protein, um, I'm still a big proponent of food quality, micronutrient status as well. Um, and then, you know, even things like attentive eating and, you know, the pace of eating, uh, you know, chewing our meals, I think a lot of times in kind of our fast paced Western lifestyle, we neglect some of those basics. And then I think there's a lot of lifestyle factors that play into dietary success as well that aren't always food centric variables. So, um, like I mentioned sleep and sunlight earlier, I think that plays a big role too, in terms of how someone is kind of caring about their day, uh, in addition to some of the nutrition variables that we've talked about too. Without question. Great, um, great share, you know, the, uh, the sleep and the uh, sunlight and that circadian rhythm. We talk about that so much. It was just a study that came out in JAMA that really spoke about the time restrictive eating, which we know is fasting and feeding during the day. And, uh, whereas intermittent fasting is, you know, skipping a day and then eating a day and stuff of that nature. And the hours were 16 and eight, which really goes with your circadian rhythm. You probably only have about 12 hours of sunlight. So you're making sure 7 a.m. in this study to 3 p.m. So that really echoes what you're saying. And the yo-yo, um, the thing that I was curious about 
and somebody just uh, used the cell phone. They always do that. Uh, they didn't put the question up there. Where does detox come in with this idea of yo-yo? And is it a player with the yo-yo? And is it needed during weight loss or body composition improvement? Yeah. So the way I think of detoxification is that if we're providing our body with the raw materials it needs, detoxification is an endogenous process, but can be impaired if we have impaired micronutrient status or we're sort of overburdening ourselves from the other end of the perspective, you know, other end of the spectrum, which is, you know, why do we need things like antioxidants and why do we need detoxification? Well, um, you know, obviously it's serving, it, it sort of keeps us in this state of homeostasis where, uh, you know, our overall body burden is well managed. Now, if we're in a state where we have excess free radicals, reactive oxygen species, we don't have enough antioxidants. Um, we're in a situation where maybe using the example in women, we're having a hard time clearing estrogen or something like that, or detoxification is impaired, that can certainly have consequences. So I think we do see that show up in client transformation, but a lot of times it's coming back to some of those nutritional basics and lifestyle factors that have contributed to the imbalance in the first place. Uh, or if we're looking at, you know, our various detoxification pathways, potentially they need support there uh, from a nutritional perspective and micronutrient perspective to keep that online functioning optimally. But there's probably something they're doing in their lifestyle that's increasing the burden on that system. And so we really need to look at it at both a habit and lifestyle practice oriented approach in addition to, okay, what can we do from a nutrition and supplementation perspective to enhance what their body should be doing already? I think where detox is... Um, maybe overused is people view the detox as the solution to the weight loss, as opposed to part of uh, a healthy sort of endogenous process that our body should be doing anyways, right? They'll go buy a four day, five day, seven day detox tea, as opposed to, oh, I'm going to manage my nutrition and I'm going to do these things from a sleep and circadian rhythm perspective to get my micronutrients in and maybe I'm going to use a supplement that helps support my overall antioxidant status and detoxification. Uh, that's a totally different conversation than people that view it as a shortcut solution. Uh, now, obviously it does play a role in terms of your overall health, but uh, I think sometimes folks are looking for a shortcut around the actual challenges that come with weight management and weight loss and appetite regulation and being able to adhere to things over time as opposed to, uh, you know, maybe they're what they've been doing previously. So that's, that's where I see that conversation come up a lot. I don't, I don't think, uh, I don't think we should neglect detox, but there's certainly different situations where it becomes more important than others. And I do see a lot of practitioners where they'll do things like they want to ramp up detoxification on in, in one phase of detoxification and they neglect things like maybe our GI health or other parts of the system, right? Maybe they're, they're looking at, the liver, but they're not looking at the gut or they're looking at maybe one particular supplement, but the supplement has some blind spots in terms of uh, all of the phases. And we see this with, uh, you know, even estrogen detoxification as well. And I like the analogy that Carrie Jones uses in terms of, if you think of the bathtub in the house, you got the water running from the faucet, you have the actual drain in the bathtub, and then you have the pipes that run out of the house into the backyard um, and kind of go from there. We have some some clients and coaches and practitioners where they're only maybe focusing on one particular part of that, whether it's the faucet, the drain or the pipes, as opposed to looking at it collectively at a, as a system and saying, okay, what might be affecting, you know, this particular uh, process and how do we support it so that this person, you know, feels their best and achieves the best possible result. Without question, we have to look at the body as a system and, and some of the points that you really touched on, it's not just one thing. It's a combination of many things. There's not one thing that breaks our harmonious status going from health to disease. Right. It's a multitude of things. You know, yesterday I heard somebody talking about toxins. And it's not one toxin that causes leaky gut, as we segue to the gut. It's multiple toxins. It's not just gluten. It's probably gluten. It's probably dairy. It's probably sugar. It's that litany list of things. And uh, you really did a great segue with liver into gut because the biggest question is, what do you treat first, liver and gut? And I think we've all agreed upon now that you kind of want to do them together. But let's talk a little bit about gut health basics and some common digestive issues. One of those buzz things where people would say, I had that, Sam. 
Yeah. So I think with gut health basics, it can contribute. So a lot of folks who have digestive complaints and that's showing up in terms of their symptoms or things that I refer to as kind of this class of biofeedback. Uh, some of my favorite things to look at are sleep, hunger signals, uh, recovery from exercise, your energy levels, fatigue and cognition throughout the day, digestion um, and stress. And so when we're under stress or we are chronic dieting or folks who are on the standard American diet, there's a number of different reasons why we might have digestive issues. But uh, some of the biggest ones that I see would be related to chronic stress. Um, you know, if we're, if we're not necessarily sleeping, like I do see a fair amount of night shift workers who will struggle with their digestion and have some issues there. Uh, we have the mechanical components of digestion where maybe people are rushing their eating, not chewing. Uh, when you combine that with a stressful lifestyle, potentially enzymatic insufficiencies and things like that, people run into issues. So as far as some of the things that we see, it can really range from you know, things that are addressed relatively simply with changing, you know, meal timing, meal practices, slowing down, um, and maybe looking at some food combinations and the size of the actual meal itself. Uh, those are, those are some very, very basics. And even things like going for a five to 10 minute walk. I don't know if you saw the study, Dr. Silverman, but there was one, I think it was 2021, you know, going for that postprandial walk was as efficacious as the prokinetic medication, uh, in terms of that, sort of head-to-head -head trial there. So a lot of times I just have people start going for uh, a nice little walk after their largest meal of the day. That really seems to help with things. And then just looking at obviously overall food quality as well can be a big one. But then there are folks where if they have been following that sad diet, that Western style of eating, um, their body is kind of in that state of chronic low-grade inflammation, their insulin resistance, or excuse me, they are insulin resistant or experiencing insulin resistance. Uh, you know, they begin to have GI issues as well. And those are the folks where we're seeing, you know, systemic inflammation, but also intestinal permeability, GI issues, leaky gut, as you talk about quite frequently. And then that's leading to immune activation, more inflammation, more issues, kind of this vicious cycle um, that goes round and round and round. So I think there's tiers to which we see people experiencing gut complaints, some of which can be addressed in a very, very basic fashion with some nutritional support um, or supplement support, lifestyle changes, uh, eating pace, postprandial walks, things of that nature. And then there are situations where maybe we have a more severe issue at play, maybe a small intestinal bacterial overgrowth, or you know they're also experiencing intestinal permeability, uh, or maybe there's a stealth infection or fungal issue going on. But I do think a lot of folks can tackle some low-hanging fruit first, and that's going to help get some traction related to their gut health. Uh, and then you can you sort of layer things in from there where maybe, you know, they might need, if the symptoms still persist, they might need a more complex protocol. But some of my favorites, just as far as the, when we talk about gut health basics, postprandial walking, you know, attentive eating, you know, making sure we're not eating this massive meal, watching TV and scarfing our food down, um, you know, moving away from the standard American diet and uh, some of those choices. I know you and I have talked about uh, omega-6 to omega-3 ratio, and then micronutrient support, I think is really big too. So those would be maybe three to five of some of the big things that I pay attention to. And then obviously exercise can help as well. So we talked about walking, but exercise, you know, when used appropriately and not overdoing it, that can also be very positive for the overall state of the microbiome as well. So uh, that's where we have this really nice intersection of fitness, nutrition, and functional health, um, and kind of movement as medicine as part of your overall protocol. So I've had two questions. One was a text. So I wrote it in. How long a walk is needed for a positive effect after a meal? And let's piggyback that to Janet's question. Should you wait a certain period of time to walk after your biggest meal? I think, I mean, assuming it's a leisurely stroll, um, I think you should be able to kind of go for your walk uh, relatively soon after the meal, maybe you, you know, put some things away, um, you know, you wrap up eating and maybe you go for a walk. Maybe it's with your partner or significant other or your family, or you're able to get outside for a little bit. Uh, I've seen benefits for clients in as short as five to 10 minutes. And, you know, maybe as long as 30 to 60 minutes, just depending on their schedule and their personal preferences. But, uh, I don't think it needs to, you know, you don't need to go walk five miles to have a benefit in terms of your digestion. And I think the study that Dr. Silver, Silverman and I were referring to is actually a relatively short walk uh, and still still having some clear, clear cut benefits for uh, the study population. So do what you can and don't make it so overwhelming that you neglect the foundational habit. I would say, you know, 
put it, maybe start at five or 10 minutes and then see how you feel. And if it's something that's working well for your routine, gradually build on the amount of time that you have. But I like to stack those two together. And usually for most pe people, it's going to be, um, you know, the biggest, biggest meal as far as shunting the blood away from digestion to the muscular system, it, that's going to be relative to the intensity of exercise. So I think if you keep with a, the goal here is a very leisurely stroll, not, um, not going for a run. We're not doing resistance training. We're not doing anything that's going to require, uh, you know, intense activity. So while there's definitely some, you know, I, I think we remember our parents back in the day saying, Hey, wait 30 minutes before you go in the pool after eating. Right. They were probably, probably had some good intentions there, but I think if it's very low grade physical activity, you should be okay. Um, and if it was a part of the problem is if it's a super massive, massive meal, we need to look at the meal size as much as we need to look at the actual timing of the walk. So I just say, don't overthink it. Do what's going to work for you. If you feel like you need, you know, 10 minutes or you want to kind of hang out for a little bit and then go for the walk. Um, that's okay. I'm sure we could parse out some more study specifics there in terms of what they actually found in the research, but I've had folks, you know, they finish, they clean up, they put the stuff away from the meal and they just head out on a short, you know, 10 minute walk and they're good to go. So I'd say just be careful not to, not to, uh, overthink it too much, keep it pretty simple. And then if you notice, uh, maybe you want to wait a little bit longer. That's totally fine. If you find that you feel best, you know, you finish your plate and then you walk outside, like that's great too. It's all about what finding, finding kind of that individual dose that works best for you. I don't know that it's necessarily perfect recipe for every single person. Um, but I wouldn't sweat too much as far as the shunting the blood away from the digestive tract. That would be more like you ate a large meal and you went straight to the gym and you did an intense training session that would be more problematic for your digestion than a, than a very leisurely walk. Yeah. Um, you know, my wife and I have been trying to eat out, you know, when we eat out, we try and eat outside more. It's beautiful. I'm in New York. We've had a stunning weather summer and we've been just, we get up and we walk around the block in the village just for a few minutes. Um, some people may even consider that 15 minute walk, um, just enough for their exercise for the day, which is all right. If that's all you have allotted, that's a great time to do it. You know, um, the, I, I think it was a 46% and I have to check that number, a tremendous decrease in the blood sugar after walking. Yeah, It's, it's the postprandial glycemic control as well. Not just the GI, you, you know, obviously it is going to help with digestion, um, and motility overall, and just kind of keeping things, you know, to where uh, maybe you don't have the same postprandial fullness, but we do get some great blood sugar benefits as well. And I think since a lot of a lot of the American population does have some less favorable markers in terms of blood glucose control, fasting insulin levels, A one C, I think, hey, why not have a little bit of movement after the meal? Because that's a great way to help uh, kind of bring things back into balance from a blood sugar homeostasis perspective. Excellent. So you're a big proponent of eating and exercising and all that. What, what a concept. Yeah. Yeah. Big, big fan, especially I've, I've really grown. I think when I started out, right, I was always very conventional, um, you know, Hey, resistance training, cardiovascular exercise, things like that. And, and with age and a little bit of wisdom and working with a wide variety of clients, I've learned to appreciate little things like walking so much more than I did. You know, when I was younger, I wouldn't even really count walking or step count as much as exercise. And now I emphasize it so much and actually use it as a tool when we are titrating those things or just getting someone into more of um, a healthy, you know, healthy movement patterns. So uh, I think walking can go a really long way and just keeping a general idea of your non-exercise movement. I mean, that's a key component. You know, we started off the conversation with metabolism and looking at total daily energy expenditure. We can't neglect non-exercise activity. Um, and especially when our body is sort of, I don't know if you've seen any of Herman Ponzer's work or, um, mm -hmm. Amy Loyola at, or Amy Duke, uh, I forget her last name. His first name is Amy. She's at Loyola and then Herman Ponzer's at Duke and looking at sort of the nature of which, uh, our metabolism may adapt and different sort of constrained factors related to TDE. And so we can't just add more exercise, exercise, exercise. Eventually our body has a constraint to which like we're, we're not just burning exponentially more calories on top of that. Our body sort of throttles down that exercise activity thermogenesis, um, or we'll make sort of adjustments or compensations to be thrifty in terms of our calorie burn. 
And what's great about non-exercise activity is it does seem to really help not only in its contribution to total daily calorie burn and energy expenditure, but it's also has all those other benefits that Dr. Silverman and I talked about from a digestive health perspective. It's parasympathetic. So whereas a lot of intense exercise, if these people are very high stress, um, high sympathetic drive, sympathetic nervous system activation, they probably need some parasympathetic activity. So a walk in nature is a great way to kind of kill two or three birds with one stone. You get the parasympathetic activity, postprandial glucose control, and you get improved digestive health. Um, so it's kind of a three for one, which is why I think with uh, age and a little bit of wisdom, I've become such a big proponent of something that's just so, so basic. And it's also, you know, it's it's affordable and anybody can do it, right? So it's it's just easy to to get uh, most clients on that type of regime uh, a little bit more simply than maybe a more advanced training protocol or something like that. And you really spoke about for clients and, and patients to go to someone mm -hmm. who will individualize it and personalize it for them. And a lot has to do with the age. Um, you know, I've got you by decades. And, you know, just, just looking at the resistance, you know, hey, no problem, guys, my age. We used to go to the gym three, four days in a row for weights, right. that's not happening at somebody in the middle age. It's just not going to recover. Same thing for the ladies. So again, it's a real great theme that everybody has to have resonate that you've got to have. It doesn't matter if the trainer is 20 or 80, that trainer, male or female has to understand you and where you are. And you talk a lot about hormones and that's great. Now, one thing I wanted to hit you with, and you don't have to go off on it. I'll I'll reel it back in parasympathetic. So for me as a chiropractor, I hear parasympathetic, I, I start getting edgy. People say I, I act ADHD. In that parasympathetic, it's all about the vagus nerve. So the vagus nerve is that um, idea of the nerve which balances the autonomic nervous system. Now there's foods that do it. There's activities like you spoke about, like walking, you could sing, you could hum and stuff like that. But the idea of hormones, because that parasympathetic system works with hormones, you really get in and you do a great job on talking about hormones from exercise and even some of the reproductive hormones, some of the related issues and concerns. So I kind of want to softball it to you and see where you can go with that. So I think in our modern society, right, uh, you know, we first let's like back up and what are one of the issues that, that we've kind of been central to today's talk and theme is stress has largely been sort of decoupled from movement. So when we're experiencing stressors and we have sort of this fight or flight response, uh, you know, it's a totally different scenario when you have that sort of, uh, HPA activation coupled with activity versus, okay, we're sitting around or I got a stressful email or stressful text message, or I have some sort of, uh, interpersonal conflict of some kind. I think it's just very different in our modern society than what we would have experienced hundreds or thousands of years ago. And what we tend to see when that happens, people have consistent issues in terms of now cortisol, right? And like a Goldilocks amount maybe isn't so much of a problem if it's happening at the right times in terms of our cortisol awakening response and things like that. But when we have this consistent sort of stress response or fight or flight response or alertness response, we do tend to see reproductive hormone decline or reproductive hormone adaptations that are less favorable, especially for people who are looking to optimize things like whether it's testosterone in males or uh, maybe if fertility is top of mind for a female, when we have that very stress-centric environment, it tends to lead to adaptations in terms of lowered progesterone and ultimately impacting fertility, uh, especially for women. So we just have to be cognizant of sort of that stress reproductive hormone connection in terms of what's going on there. Now, obviously nutrition plays a huge role too, but if we're not sort of uh, monitoring those checks and balances or drains and charges on the system, uh, it, it can have some widespread sort of systemic effects in terms of downregulating those reproductive hormones as a result of stress that we're experiencing. So that's something I definitely see a lot uh, with, with clients as well. And that will also play into, you know, you mentioned recovery earlier in terms of overall uh, across the lifespan. You know, if, if you're, if you are sort of struggling uh, with, with overall energy levels, with recovery, with some of those symptoms and biofeedback indications, you know, that might be a good that it may not be good, but it may be a sign or a good indicator that you maybe are experiencing some hormonal and metabolic adaptations as a result of your lifestyle, nutrition, or um, high stress. So those are always things that I like to pay attention to as well. 
Last one, and this one is the big one. I saved it for the end. Thyroid. I can't. I, if I had a penny for every time somebody came in and said I had a thyroid problem, when thyroid was the end result and not the cause of everything, you and I would be able to have my organic coffee all day, every day. So <laughs> let's delve in. Let's yeah, dig so in. Let's talk about it. I do think thyroid and reproductive hormones at times can be lagging indicators. Or if we were to think of it this way, if we had a house, we have the we have the ground and the foundation of the house, we have the first floor of the house, the second floor of the house, a lot of folks see, whether it's in labs or biofeedback related symptoms, they see the thyroid or reproductive hormone related issues, or they feel those, uh, or p- potentially maybe there's a quantitative marker that they're checking. But a lot of times underneath the surface, there's you know, stress or catabolic physiology, um, oxidative stress, insulin resistance, or excess inflammation that are contributing to some of the adaptations that we see in those hormones. So whether it is um, thyroid being impacted, so, you know, that T4 to T3 conversion can be impacted by a number of things, inflammation, chronic dieting, nutrient deficiencies. So if someone's having subclinical or hypothyroid symptoms, that could be very simply because of the three or four things that I mentioned. Uh, if someone's having reproductive hormone decline, as we mentioned earlier, we're kind of looking at, okay, maybe we have a tilted floor on, or something's going on in the second floor of the house, but maybe we should be checking the first floor and the foundation for some of these core issues that may actually be having a ripple effect that are that are uh, sort of impacting these things downstream. So, you know, Dr. Silverman talks a lot about uh, gut health, right? And so with gut health, we have to think about okay, well, the gut and the liver play an important role in terms of the deiodinase enzymes that influence the actual metabolically active free T3 that we have. So when a lot of folks have thyroid issues, you need to kind of zoom out for a second, once again, bringing it back to that full body systems approach and think to yourself, well, what would be impacting that total amount of uh, free thyroid hormone that we have? Or what's, what's kind of the weak link in the chain that's impacting what we're seeing both from a you know, either lab perspective or, you know, in terms of someone's symptoms overall, we usually don't just, you know, as, as we talked about earlier in the interview, we don't just end up there or something doesn't just break. We are, uh, you know, there's probably this sort of progressive or compound, uh, stimulus that leads our body to adapt in a certain way. And really what we're witnessing is the body's adaptive physiology at play, which is why I talk so much about, you know, uh, metabolism, hormones, stress, uh, the endocrine system and gut, because all of those things sort of work together to, you know, uh, whether we're in a state of optimal health or whether we're having unfavorable symptoms, usually it comes back to those systems. So thyroid is the tundra, right? Yeah. Thyroid. I think we get a lot of questions or a lot of people attribute maybe weight loss woes or energy levels and fatigue to thyroid, which, you know, we, we certainly thyroid is incredibly important and plays a massive role in terms of our overall health. But we just have to understand, well, what might be preceding the thyroid issue? We just have to go one layer deeper than just only saying, oh, well, it's a thyroid problem. Well, okay, well, why, why are we having, you know, the, the thyroid issues that we're having? Is there something else that's contributing to where we're ending up there? Um, and that's why I think we, we see sometimes maybe uh, such a drastic increase in terms of people ending up on thyroid medication, when maybe there was something else going on where if we would have worked on that for a little bit, maybe we could have avoided some of those problems. So somebody comes in or, and somebody contacts you and they think they have a thyroid issue. What would be some of the things that you would want to rule out before thinking the thyroid is the cause versus thyroid is the end result? Yeah, of course. So I'm going to look at overall lifestyle stress. Uh, I'm going to look at a food journal that would basically give me insights in terms of potential sources for, uh, you know, micronutrient deficiency. So if I have a relatively poor food quality or I'm not eating the necessary micronutrients, you know, even seeing changes in selenium, zinc, uh, very basic nutrients can impact what we're seeing with our hormones. So we want to make sure that we're eating, you know, a very good quality diet that contains those nutrients that we need from a micronutrient perspective. I'll look at biofeedback in terms of their symptoms. Are we having any digestive issues? So if someone's having gut issues that can connect uh, fairly closely with what we see in terms of thyroid as well. And if we have gut issues, that's going to impact micronutrient absorption, which then brings us back to that first point that I had. So micronutrients and gut are going to be big. Um, and then, you know, in addition to that, I think stress can be huge, chronic dieting, you know, being in the fitness industry, we see a lot of folks who are kind of in this social media sphere or bubble where 
as we kind of discussed earlier in the episode, always on a diet or always following the next thing. We have to understand during times of energy restriction and high stress, part of, you know, and we have research on this for years is just what we see when the body is somewhat uh, in an energy restricted state, which for short periods of time can be healthy for weight loss. But if you do it over and over and over again with no break or no sort of season or phases to it, we see upregulated HPA axis function, downregulated thyroid and downregulated reproductive hormones. So if you combine that chronic dieting, high stress with poor micronutrient status and then gut health issues, you have a recipe for a thyroid issue. Then a lot of folks are walking in, raising their hand saying, I think I need help with my thyroid when really there's three or four compounding factors that led us to that point. Without question. Uh, I agree with you. Thyroid for me is the end result. It's not necessarily the cause. And uh, unfortunately, the medical model, people go on Synthroid way too soon and way too early. And then even on that Synthroid, it's not always optimized because they can't convert the T4 to the T3 optimally anyways. So they're still having symptoms, even though the T4 maybe brought their TSH down into the Western range. But they're still having problems. So it's kind of a vicious cycle there too. Yeah, it's, it's the tundra, as I said. Um, I really appreciate a lot of the time that you've given. I got a couple of things that I wanted to share. You have a program for health professionals. You wanted to uh, give a little explanation? Yeah, on sure. That? So I, uh, you know, I essentially set out to create something that I wish I had over a decade ago. I spent a lot of time uh, seeking out different industry resources, mentors, and wanted to create something that was a live experience, not just a weekend seminar where you can't ask questions after the fact. And I think there's also with the convenience of the digital model, there's so many programs that are just DIY self-study courses. And for some people, especially with advanced topics, you need a little bit more uh, hands-on application, case studies, practice, support. It's, it's like, you know, when... Uh, the pilots at Delta go to fly a commercial airline, you would hope that they're not flying the plane for the first time when they have hundreds of people on board. And I don't think, you know, health, when it comes to health coaches, we've worked with, you know, chiropractors, nurses, PAs, uh, osteopathic physicians as well, shouldn't be dealing with your first case or flying that first flight with hundreds of people on board. You need to get, you know, some flight simulator time first. So the idea behind our live program is essentially giving people not only the information via the modules and the education resources and guides, but also giving them a safe place where you have a community of professionals that are practicing these things in the trenches. You can kind of look over their shoulders, see how they do it, uh, learn in sort of a live collaborative environment. We have guest speakers who come in and speak on their expertise so you can learn from them. And then in addition to that, you actually practice uh, by implementing some different case studies. And if you do happen to have a client who's challenging and maybe you don't know 100% of the answers, we have a team of professionals that can come in and essentially support you with that. So that program is the Functional Nutrition and Metabolism Specialization. That's part of uh, Metabolism School. And as of the time of this interview, that's just linked at www.metabolismschool.com. But I also link it on a lot of my social media resources. So if you go to uh, any of the Samler Science pages or podcasts, you'll find resources for that as well. If you're newer to my material and today was kind of first exposure to my content, I always recommend just start with the podcast. We've got so much complimentary, no cost content. It's a great place for people to just get acquainted and learn some stuff. And then if you decide you need a little bit more support, then we have the programs for that as well. Terrific. So if people want to get in touch with you, that's the best way to uh, contact you. Yeah, that's the best way to get the information. I spend a lot of time. Uh, we do three three podcast episodes a week. And then I'm pretty much posting on social media in some form or fashion, usually Instagram, uh, just about probably five, five to seven days a week. So plenty of content to go around. Uh, and through there, you can find some of my resources and different things that I share through my newsletter too. So those are always a great place to start. Um, and then I have a little content hub at samlerscience.com. So if you pick one of those, you'll, you'll probably make your way into the ecosystem and then we can help you out with some more stuff. Well, Sam, I have to tell you, this has been without question illuminating. We have to do it again. It's been my pleasure. I have Mr. Sam Miller. I'm Dr. Robert Silverman, Proven Health Alternatives.